welcome everyone. We are here today to do um, a bit of a talk about Enlister in the Pyrenees. And uh, well, my name is Marlene Oliveira. I'm a code breaker and um, an accidental researcher and serial annoyer of archivists and librarians. Sorry about that, guys. It's the usual. Uh, and to start, we'll go with the usual disclaimer uh, in which I usually tell you that this is about the real Anne Lister and you should put the fiction version of her in a box for the next hour or so. Another thing you should be aware of is that if you're expecting Anne Lister, the, um, the god, sorry to disappoint, this will be Anne Lister, the human. And well... This is a recording of an original talk given uh, in Anne Lister's birthday uh, this year of 2023. It was initially delivered at the Calderdale office of the West Yorkshire Archive Service. And um, on the day there were items on display to go with it. You will not see those on display today, but I will make a reference um, and I will talk a little bit about them in the end of this presentation. So, without further ado, uh, the clicker stopped working. Okay. Who was Anne Lister? Well, Anne Lister was a lady from Halifax in West Yorkshire. She was a prolific diarist, wrote 26 volumes of journals and a few of those pages. She also wrote 14 travel journals and over a thousand letters. So there's quite a little bit of stuff she she wrote. Aside from this, there are other papers that she left behind, which you could explore if you are into archival stuff, and it's very cool, recommended. Uh, the journals chronicle different aspects of Anne Lister's life, including a romantic relationships with other women, uh, but there are other stuff, details about the society of the time, the people she met, the place she went, uh, because as you probably know by now, she was an accomplished traveler uh, and undertook several tours of the United Kingdom and also traveled across Europe. Um, aside from this, she was also a keen, inf infrequent mountaineer, and the journals also chronicle her ascents of some mountains um, in the British Isles and in Europe. And now we go to the Pyrenees. So the Pyrenees uh, are a mountain range that separates uh, France and Spain. Uh, they extend for about 500 kilometers, and for those of you who work on um, Imperial, this is the equivalent to 310 miles. The mountain range extends from the Cantabrian mountains to Cap de Creus on the, the Mediterranean um, coast. So if you look at that cool map over there, you'll see Cap de Creus on your uh, right hand side, the little thing uh, that on the yellow, the yellow part right below the, the border. So um, the Pyrenean landscape differs from the Alpine landscape in the sense that there are no great lakes. You would find an abundance of gave, which are mountain tor torrents, and waterfalls. There are very few mountain passes, and most of them are at a higher altitude. Um, the highest summit in the Pyrenees is Pico Aneto in the Maladeta Massif, and it rises to 3,404 meters or 11,168 feet. Uh, the highest waterfall is the Cascade de Gavarni. It's the highest one in Europe, uh, and it goes uh, to 460 meters, uh, it's 462 meters, sorry, or uh, 1,515 feet. Um, before she got to the Pyrenees, and Lister could see them at a distance because she was traveling uh, towards the mountains, and there were a lot of flat plains. This obviously warranted some observations in the journal, and this is one of them. The nearer I approach the High Pyrenees, the less I compare them to the snow-clad uh, clad Alps. But they are better approached, seen to more advantage. Where can one so go up to, from a white plain, the chain of Alps? These are like a fine cathedral built up. The others like a less fine cathedral in a beautiful close. So she compares them to a thing she, she likes to see, which are cathedrals. Um, 
but Enlister is not the only person looking at the, the Pyrenees from a distance. Uh, at the time she wrote this, she was traveling with Charlotte Stewart de Rothesay, and the girl was in the, um, in the same carriage, and she made the following comment. Now these are mountains. So at least someone was actually impressed with what they wanted, uh, what they were seeing. And Lister was more like, eh, the Alps were probably a little bit better. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, this is the start of the 1830 tour of the Pyrenees. So in classic and Lister fashion, before you go on a tour, you have to go with planning. And planning for an enlister involves a set of things, which, you know, could be more or less complex depending on the trip. In this case, the planning of the 1830 trip was a collaboration with Lady Stewart de Rothsay. And uh, it started uh, as a way, in Anne's view at least, to just get herself perhaps some connections in, in uh, higher society, or uh, maybe the acquaintance would deepen and she would get in a more advantageous place to meet more people in higher society, because Lady Stuart de Rothsay was an important lady, as we'll see in a moment. Um, so in planning, she starts by uh, acquiring books, maps, and other materials that might help uh, to plan the journal uh, journey and um, estimate costs. We see here an example of a list of books that she packed for that trip. And if you look closely, you will find almanacs, guides, uh, travel guides, atlases, maps, uh, some guides to the Pyrenees, and then random stuff like grammars for French, uh, um, Latin dictionaries, Greek dictionaries, Italian dictionaries, and um, then some light reading like Horace and Voltaire's letters. So yeah, light reading, because what do you do if you go on a trip and you don't bring re a proper reading material? So uh, beyond this, she also goes and gets advice to about the, the, the intended routes uh, from other people. Uh, and she wants to know which are the best routes for accommodation, um, best routes and accommodation, sorry. So first, first one to give some input is Lord Stuart Rotsay, who just told them, uh, try to go by Bordeaux and, and see how it goes. And then Enlist asked, asked Maurice, who was her hotelier at the time in Paris, and uh, he offered to, to get her an itinerary with the best hotels and the best routes. Um, finally, she also got advice about provisions from Monsieur and Madame Droz. And they just thought, hey, you might want to bring wine and tea to the Pyrenees, just in case, just in case. So aside from this, she then goes and buys some supplies, uh, which she thinks might be necessary, such as clothes, um, journal books, itineraries of the Pyrenees and other items of the sort. And uh, the last step is figuring out when to actually depart. Uh, and this, this took a while to, to, to get decided with Lady Stuart Rothsay because Anne kept wanting to go and Lady Stuart Rothsay kept wanting to wait. So eventually after a while, they fixed the 20th of July of 1830 uh, with Enlister leaving first on her own carriage and Lady Stuart Rothsay following an hour later with the kids and, and her own servants. So who are Enlister's travel companions? So you can see them here, um, these three three ladies. The oldest one is actually Lady Stuart uh, Rothsay. She was the wife of the uh, ambassador to France uh, was Charles Stewart, first Baron Drotsay, and uh, she met him listed in 1829 through familial connections with Sibel McLean and um, Vir Hobart. At the time, Anne Lister thought she was very civil. Uh, later on, she would comment that Lister Drotsay was very elegant at um, an embassy ball, and later on, there is the occasional cross in Kurt's 
thinking about Lady Stuart Rothsay. So as you might imagine, it kind of went well. Um, then you have Charlotte Stuart Rothsay, who was the, the eldest daughter of uh, Lady Stuart Rothsay. She would eventually uh, become a Lady of the Bedchamber for Queen Victoria, and she would marry Charles Canning in 1835. If you are thinking about Canning's the politicians, you are thinking correctly, you'll find the link quite easily there. Um, and then you have Louisa Stewart, who was the youngest daughter and also the prettiest, uh, especially when she was older. And she was an accomplished artist, later married Henry Bresford, who was the third uh, and became the third Marquis of uh, Waterford. The only thing you probably will not find much of are um, archival sources for her, because even though she was an accomplished artist and some of her art is still in existence, the papers have allegedly not survived. Most of them have been allegedly destroyed. Whether there is stuff out there or not, I cannot tell you. That would be something you can find out for yourself if you'd like. So during the, the Pyrenees of 1830, both Louisa and, and Charlotte traveled at times with Anne Lister in her carriage and didn't dislike them, but, you know, it's traveling with kids. Uh, she, she sort of liked Louisa. She thought she was um, a favorite of Louisa more than Charlotte, but she didn't particularly favor one or two, because the point is to charm uh, the mother to actually like her as a person um, and not not making that, being that, that concerned about the kids. So um, after a while, they are traveling for a few days and they reach Po in the south of France and they have to stop there because there's a, a revolution uh, going, uh, just uh, having happened in Paris the um, correspondence and uh, the news are severely delayed and Lady Stuart Rothsay becomes a bit uh, nervous about the state because they don't know if they are safe or not. They have to wait for a while. So there, there are a few days that they spend there and then Lister is bored out of her mind, absolutely bored out of her mind. And to her journal, she eventually <laughs> makes a comment on how things are going. And it goes like this. I am heartily tired of this life of travel. It will be a good lesson for me for the future. I began this morning to count the days to my release. I get no real walking. I am getting rather fatter and all day tortured by dress too tight. Oh, that I was unknown and walking and running about at my age. So as you might have figured out by now, it was going splendidly. She couldn't wait to be rid of them. So eventually, Lord Stuart Rothsay will write south and say, you are fine where you are, uh, so do, do your thing. And they just go about um, traveling again. And eventually, they start exploring in the Pyrenees themselves. And this includes a set of activities at the, uh, for this time, which, you know, includes some excursions to explore the surrounding areas, some sketching as the, you can see proof of that here. This is a sketch that is actually in, a, in an album that still exists. It's held at the West Yorkshire Archive Service in Calderdale. You can request this and see this uh, in the archive. This is actually a, a sketch by Lady Stuart Rothsay. You can see her signature there. This is Saint Sauveur in, in uh, France, uh, in the Pyrenees. And uh, you, you'll find a couple of more sketches from that trip from other parts the, and places they, they visited, but those are, are authored by the, the children, the Stuart Rothsay children and not the mother. So this one was actually a very, very interesting thing, uh, I thought that should go with this to highlight um, one of the activities they did. Um, so, and, and also went with the Lady Stuart Rothsay and the, the kids to see uh, monuments and church uh, and all sorts of, of things, uh, views, churches. Um, she went on excursions with a local guide who was Jean-Pierre Charles. Charles, well, she, she, Except, uh, except hired uh, Charles uh, when she got to Saint-Sauveur. 
Uh, he had good references. He had been a guide to, to a couple of relatively famous people at the time. And she thought, why not? So they went around uh, seeing uh, the views and the mountains and uh, exploring other other um, landmarks that Lady Stuart Rothsay didn't necessarily uh, want to visit. And then Lady Stuart got the exercise she wanted. Occasionally, Anne would go shopping with Lady Stuart de Rothsay. Um, but the bulk of Anne's time um, spent with Lady Stuart Rothsay was done at night. No, not like that. They were gossiping, and their gossip included a myriad of topics, such as, is it proper to go to the theater on Sundays? Is that a sin? Should you actually do it? So that is one of their discussions. Another one is, um, get the, for example, gossip about other stewards, like old lady stewards, and uh, Veer's marriage prospects, and who could be the, the suitors for her at the time. Uh, and this, this went on by hours and hours and hours and hours. And then later on, and Lister starts to go into, into more um, risky topics, and it starts to get particularly funny, because she keeps going deeper and deeper into stuff that is not necessarily what you'd expect for polite conversation with Lady Stuart Rutsley. So aside from the propriety of going to the theatre on Sundays, she also hints about her alleged collection of some of the worst things she had ever read. She never says what it was, but it was probably interesting. Then she goes on to tell stories about entertainment at inns in Beverly, where candles go into funny places. Whether this is safe or not, it's open to interpretation. But Lady Stuart Rodsey heard all about it. Uh, then eventually they move into the topic that got me wondering what she was thinking, because she started to discuss bestiality in the Bible in some level of detail. So I was a little bit surprised to read that in retrospective. I probably shouldn't, but, you know, Anne Lister being Anne Lister. And Lady Stuart Rothsay was so interested that she even put aside the newspaper she had. And she just gave Anne Lister her all attention. So I guess she was also curious as to, as to where that, that um, was going to go. So in 1830... As I said, one of the uh, one of Anlister's activities was mountaineering, and 1830 was not a prolific year for a mountaineering career. But even so, she she actually undertook two two climbs in the Pyrenees, which were the Pic de Bergon and Mont Perdu. Mont Perdu is actually an Iceland mark ascent for, for 1830. It was a strenuous climb. It involved quite a bit of, of uh, effort to, to get there. She undertook part of it uh, by candlelight, which did mean, uh, make things easier. And this would be the tallest peak that Anne would ever climb at 3,355 meters. We have a tendency to think about, um, about Mont Perdu as being a bit in the shade of Vinamal, because Vinamal is a bigger achievement. It's a, 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 the first uh, climb by by um, a tourist. But in in terms of height, Purdue is actually taller than Vinamal. So she this would be the highest peak of her career uh, in mountaineering, both in the Pyrenees and in general, because she never, never climbed anything taller than this. Uh, as a curiosity, the description of her ascent of Purdue in the main uh, journal is actually very short. There are uh, three or four uh, lines about it, not much more than that. The travel journal actually includes a lot more of that, and that's where she chronicles the ascent properly with more detail than, than in the, the main journal. But still, compared, compared with what she does for other ascents, it's still fairly self-contained. So it's a nice to have, but you'd, you'd wish that she would go into much more detail. Still, as it is, it's perfectly, perfectly fine. If you're curious about Anne's uh, mountaineering career and um, other ascents that she, she has done uh, throughout her life, we actually have an article for that in Packwick Potential. So give it a look.
and uh, explore at your will. So eventually, Anne Lister gets it in her head that she must go to Spain. And Spain becomes her greatest temptation at this, at this time because everyone keeps telling her, don't go, it's not safe. But the more people tell her, don't go, it's not safe, you'll get killed. She thinks, I must go and see what the fuss is all about. So in classic and Lister uh, fashion, she disregarded a little bit the warning that said Spain is dangerous. And it's dangerous because it was going through some turmoil at the time during the last years of the reign of King Fernando VII. Um, eventually, and Lister, you know, being enlisted, goes to Montperdu, and from Montperdu, she goes to the Spanish side of the Pyrenees. And the first stop and first ex excursion she ever did, uh, made into Spain was um, to Torla. Torla is, is a small town near the border of the, the, the Pyrenees, sorry, near the border with France. And when she got there, she and Charles are uh, followed by children. And then her passport is requ uh, is requested for inspection, and uh, this is this is one of the items we will talk about at the end of this this presentation. But uh, the funny thing is that at the day after, th there comes a captain from uh, a town called Broto near nearby, and he asks to see Enlister's papers um, because they think she's a spy, and he needs to know if if she's actually a spy or not. But then after inspecting that. He actually uh, arrives at the conclusion that no, 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 she's just very curious and very different, but she's not a spy, totally harmless. And he writes in the um, in the travel journal that she is just traveling around, sketching stuff, nothing military, perfectly fine, no suspicions here, no spying, absolutely no spying. So it's just the, the funny English lady having a look around. Um, and well, the, the, if you're interested in, in curiosities about these documents, you should be aware that uh, both the travel journal and the, the passport from this trip are seemingly the last surviving items that went with an lister to the, that, uh, to the summit of Montperdu because she would need the passport to be uh, with her so it could be checked here. And the travel journal must be with her. Otherwise, the captain would not have a chance to write uh, in it. So you have um, tangible proof that since the passport didn't change and, that, and we will get there in a moment, um, and she had the travel journal, both items were with her when she went to Montpertu because she went to Torla directly from Montpertu. So you can still see this today. Both items are held by the West Yorkshire Archive Service uh, in Calderdale. You can request them and see them and see all the stamps in the um, in the, the passport and have a look at the, the travel journal, uh, supposing that that is not under some restriction from conservation, which uh, you'd have to ask and figure it out. So the second excursion um, in Spain included a ride to the source of the Garonne, which is uh, a river, the Gar uh, sorry, the Garonne River is a, um, in a different part of the Pyrenees, closer to Bagnères de Luchon. Um, and at the time, Anne had toured that area, and she eventually went to, to Spain uh, through a mountain pass in that area. Um, on things were initially fine. She went, she went to the source of the Garonne was escorted by soldiers because people didn't in the Spanish side didn't quite believe that she was not a spy. So, so they just sent her with the um, the escort, even though people at Torla were convinced that she was absolutely fine. The people at Benasque nearby were not. So the funny English lady had an escort. Um, on the way back, that escort was removed. They decided that whether she lived or she died, she could do it herself <laughs> in her own time and however she would like. Um, and then she went to uh, to Benasque and on the way back to France, she ran into a problem with a, a customs officer. The guy thought she was a spy. And worse than that, he thought that she was a man dressed as a woman, which 
became in itself it, its its own problem. And Anne was obviously very annoyed at this. And she decided not to, to give in to the guy's demands because they, they wanted uh, to, to have her searched and not just search her baggage, also search her person. They said that they would get someone to check if she was actually a woman. This is obviously very, very humiliating for her. And she thinks, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go back to, to Benask and uh, just talk to the governor there and ask him if, if what, can I, what I can do to, to just be rid of this. And so she and the, her guide, who at the time was not Charles because she had, she had switched guys in the, in, the, in the meantime, she she went back to, to Benask and she told the governor, hey, what's up with this? The guy is telling me that they got a letter saying that I'm a man dressed as a woman, but I am obviously not. And the guy at the Benask tells him, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. So... It's fine. It's just trying to get money from you, trying to scam you into into giving her money, uh, giving him money. He has done this with other people. So come with us to a party, and you'll come back tomorrow, and it'll be absolutely fine. So then, there they go on their jolly way. They go to a party today, and Lister says the the Spanish dancing, the fandango. It's all. Um, a result on that side and the next day she comes back to the border again ready for a fight and she gets there and she she basically gets to the same exactly the same uh, customs officer and this time she tells him in no uncertain terms that she's onto the, his scheme and if she had been a man she would whip him herself so from a distance, she shows him the passport and says, this is my passport. You have seen it. I am not giving it to you. You will not see it anymore any closer. And uh, once the day, uh, the, day uh, the sun comes up, me and my guide will just go into France uh, fine, as fine as can be. And you'll be, you have to be satisfied with that. So the next day, she leaves to France without any other issues. But after this inclusion, incursion to, to, to Spain and some more sightseeing, Anne travels to, to meet Lady Stuart de Rotse and the rest of her party at saint which is a, a, a town in the south of France. When she get there, uh, gets there, Lady Stuart de Rotse had already heard about the Lister's um, troubles in Spain, and she scolded her. She thought the... Um, the issues that Anne Lister had were a lesson because before that, Lady Stuart Rotsay kept telling her, don't go into Spain, it'll be dangerous, you'll probably be arrested or worse. And then was like, no, 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 I'll be fine, I'll be absolutely fine, and it'll be fine. But then it wasn't. So now Lady Stuart Rotsay was like, I told you so. And in her journal, after she hears all this, and Lister uh, comments. After all, independence is the charm of, is the charm of life, and if this and high society are incompatible, I shall not hesitate wish uh, to choose. So she was very very done with this sort of traveling and having to explain herself to other people, which um, well for this the remainder of this trip they they continue to go together around the, the south of uh, France, and then Lisa leaves the Pyrenees. She thinks that she won't be necessarily back, but that would prove a wrong um, assumption because in 1838, she would come back with a different companion in different circumstances. So when she came back to the Pyrenees in 1838, she returned with Ann Walker. And they went there this time. It was not initially planned on their trip, but they went back this time for wellness because Anne Walker had uh, some ailments that were uh, supposed to be cured by bathing in the waters of the Pyrenees. And uh, um, a doctor in Paris had advised her to do a season of baths in the medicinal springs in the Pyrenees. And so the two of them went there. But before they, they took a detour, and headed to 
uh, Bayonne and Saint Sebastien. Uh, some funny things happened after Saint Sebastien, and eventually they got to the the, the Pyrenees on the ninth. Uh, sorry, Saint Sauveur on the 9th of July of 1838. This item right here, which you can see a little bit of, is actually the 1838 passport, which um, is a very nice document. I had uh, the, the opportunity to see it in 2020. There was just a little bit of a problem with it, which was it was almost ripped in half. It doesn't uh, stand ripped in half now because the conservation team of the West Yorkshire Archive Service did a wonderful job um, fixing it. And for a, a year or so, you could see it in uh, the Endless Serena Awards exhibition uh, in Wakefield. Now that exhibition has moved on, but you can still see this document in uh, Calderdale. You can stop by the archive and request the item to, to see it yourself. Very worth it. Very nice document. Very big. And uh, now it's not as flimsy as it used to be, thanks to conservation. Um, if you look up at uh, the stumps, and if you look closely at, at those all those stumps, you'll see most of that 1838 trip there. This one here is the uh, San Sebastian one. So you'll see other, other uh, stumps from other stops uh, they undertook. Uh, the passport had one, one curious detail, which... Um, referred to Anne Walker as her niece, and Anne Walker really hated this. So eventually there, there are some arguing, uh, there's some arguing about that. Now a little detour to the mountain guides of the Pyrenees. We have three guides that were particularly important for this trip, and I would argue for Anne Lister's career as a whole, mostly for their role in her most famous ascent. So these guys were Jean-Pierre Charles, who I spoke about a little bit before. He was her guide in 1830, but he also became her guide uh, in 1838 because he literally chased her and she was already looking for Charles. And the second she saw him, she hired him on the spot uh, because she, she really, really liked him as a guide. Um, and he was a weaver from Luge, um, and among other things, he made capes. So an Lister hired one of his capes and called it a Charles cape. So it's a really big coat, um, which is a funny thing if you consider this, because a woman from Halifax got a guide who was a weaver. So there's some irony there. Um, Charles also owned a little grange uh, near the Pic de Bergon, and uh, he had some uh, animals there, and well, it was the picturesque thing. <laughs> he had also had other clients before, uh, like um, Vincent de Chosink, who wrote the book that Anne-Lister brought absolutely everywhere in 1838, and the Duchesse de Berry, uh, who went with him to the Breche de Holland, and she was one of an, the people Anne-Lister kept following uh, not uh, in person, obviously. She wasn't a stalker like that. You could argue that. Um, it's someone she took she took as a reference of good taste. So she 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 had a note of uh, where the Duchesse de Berry had been, what she had seen, and uh, opinions, that sort of thing. Then we have uh, going back to the guides. We have Jean Pierre Sanyu or Sanju, as he's sometimes referred to. He was hired in 1838 to be Anne Walker's uh, guide, and he did that role particularly well. Uh, also per, uh, participate, uh, per, per, uh, participated later on in two pioneering climbs. One of them was Anne Lister's Vinimal climb, but another one was the Pico and Neto climb later on. He was eventually distinguished as a guide, of, a first class guide uh, in 1834 by um, a trade union called the Commission Syndicale de la Vallée de Barège. What does this do well, he would get better clients because as you ascend in the ranks as a guide, you have access to better, better and more important clients, which translates in a more income. Um, curiously, for these two guides, the I have a book that lists quite a lot of guides from the Pyrenees. They talk about both of them, but they never record anything about their families, uh, whereas an lister has recorded stuff about uh, their families which is an interesting thing because uh, she ended up preserving 
details about these men that seemingly don't survive elsewhere. So we know that Charles had a wife because she said that um, Charles's wife taught and walked around to knit a purse. And we also know that Jean-Pierre saint had a son because at some point he talks about getting medicine for his son. Um, interesting details about the, these two very unknown men that you cannot find elsewhere, supposedly. Then we have Henri Cazot, who is much more famous than the other two guys. He was the guy who, in 1837, along with Bernard Guillain Bay, found the, the route to the summit of Vinimal. They had been hired to, to do this uh, for a different tourist, but the guy eventually didn't go uh, to that summit. I have absolutely no idea why. Um, but, well, Caso and Guillain Bay certainly did. And it's there's the first um, climb of Vinimal in the sense that it's the route itself that was discovered, not the first recognized by a tourist which belongs to one blister, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, Caso is described as a brave man and one of the great, uh, greatest names of the Pyrenees with some uh, a, a great level of merit of for that. Although if you consider his history with the Lister, you might get um, a certain opinion about him. Now, moving on. Excursions and sightseeing. Almost every day in 1938 included uh, an excursion somewhere, even if it was just walking uh, around places and Walker had the particular um, enjoyable walk near their accommodations in saint sauveur and she she liked to to take short walks um there eventually they they would do do other uh sightseeing excursions some longer which include our other areas in the pyrenees and could last for several days um shorter excursions served the purpose of um exploring the, the nearby surroundings and uh, many times included sketching tours for Anne Walker's benefit. And she would sketch while Anne Lister uh, read, observe the, scene, uh, the scenery or spoke with the guides, sometimes arguing about the, the landmarks that she thought she knew better than them. Um, then other times the, the ladies and the guides would visit the landmarks and, and monuments or just Landmarks and monuments are just enjoyed the view from uh, elevated vantage points. Often, uh, this served uh, the purpose of exercise. Um, and then Lister would uh, walk uh, long distances as they moved around, often preferred this to riding her horse. And Walker was different, preferred to just ride the horse or the mule. And uh, eventually, they, they went on walks. About this item you see here, this is a, a, cro a cropped um, version of a map of the Pyrenees that belonged to Anne Lister. This is quite frankly my favorite item in the Chibden Hall collection at the moment. And um, the cool part about this is, is that this map actually went to the summit of Mont Vinimal with Anne Lister. So um, it's a unique piece. Now, Moving on, mountaineering expeditions. In 1938, and Lister undertook quite a few mountaineering expeditions and the number of summits reached uh, by her increased significantly. Hold on a second. Okay, ah, sorry about that. She completed eight ascents in the summer of the Pyrenees yeah, uh, for in the summer of 1838, new ascents included Vinimal, the Pic de Midi d'Osso, the Pimene, including the Petit Pimene, which is a little um, summit be before the the actually the highest point in that particular mountain, and the Pic de Midi de Bigorre, which she did twice. Uh, so. You have the Pic de Bergon also done twice that year. Uh, and as I said, the Pic de Midi de Bigorre. Why did she do the Pic de Midi de Bigorre? Well, she argued with, with Dan Walker, and it was a particularly bad argument. And Dan Walker kept telling her, I'm going to request Crow Nest. 
for my sister and I will move and leave you. And then Lisa was so upset about this. She couldn't figure out what to do. So she did the only logical thing that she she could think of. She got Charles and she went to climb a mountain. So I guess that if you are stressed, perhaps you should climb a mountain and see if it works. So she climbs that mountain, eventually comes back and everything is absolutely fine again. Um, they make up again and then a, a couple of days or so they go up to the Pic de Midi-Bigor again, but this time for Anne Walker's benefit, she rides to the summit of that, that mountain and then Lister as usually records this, which is interesting because uh, if you consider that the majority of these were made as part of exercise, as an exercise or a part of excursions, it's actually a fairly high number of ascents um, done. And then um, the repeats were mostly for Anne Walker's benefit. So you keep you have a, a fairly interesting record of both the ascents and Lister did, and also the ascents and Walker did. And um, it's a record that you cannot seemingly find anywhere else. Um, and you can then uh, figure out that Anne Walker did the following ascents in the Pyrenees. The Pic de Bergon, the Petit Pyrenees, the Pic du Midi de Bigorre, and the Pic du Midi d'Osso. All of, all of this, the tallest peak she ever got to was the Pic du Midi d'Osso, which uh, got her the, the little um, Hercules uh, nickname from Mariana Lawton in a letter uh, from that year. And if you look at that illustration, from um, a map uh, that I got from, from the French National uh, Library. The Pic de Midi d'Osso is actually one of the biggest um, summits in the Pyrenees, the tallest summits in the Pyrenees. So Anne Walker would, it's not the same as Perdu or Vignemal, but it's still fairly, fairly tall. So for someone who didn't usually do um, mountaineering, this is particularly good. Um, as a, as a start. Now we get to Vinemal and the Prince de la Moscawa, which is quite the story and some of you must be familiar with. Uh, Vinemal was Enlister's most famous mountaineering achievement. I've mentioned it a couple of times already. Uh, the ascent happened on the 7th of August of 1838. And for this, Enlister took only minimal gear and a small team, a team of three guides, who were Charles, Pierre and Caso. Uh, today, we can still see two items that went with Enlister to, to Vinimal. One of them is the map of the Pyrenees from a previous slide. The other one is the 1838 passport from also a previous slide. Um, and you can see the two items still in Calderdale at the archives. So as I mentioned before, Enlister was the first tourist to reach this summit. Um, and the achievement was initially attributed to this guy, the Prince de la Moscawa, whose name was Napoleon Joseph Ney. And he completed his ascent on the 11th of August of 1838. But he said he could prove it, and he very likely could, because he had a certificate from Cazot that said he was the first. And the story that he, he kept. The repeating was that Enlister never went to the summit because she allegedly felt sick on the way up, which, if you consider Enlister's point of view and meticulous records and the, the testimonies of, of her guides, is a complete lie. So this was initially a thing that went under the radar for Enlister, but one day when they come back uh, from Spain after Vinimal, she and then Walker are eating grapes that Charles bought at the market. And then Charles comes back and says, hey, are you aware that this guy is saying that you didn't go to the top, uh, to the summit of Vinimal? And obviously this doesn't go well at all. And so a dispute ensued. And this dispute was particularly interesting. Going back to the climb of an Lister on the 7th of August, 1838, when she and her guides got to the summit, she had the, um, well, they had a drink to celebrate uh, her climb. And then she used a bottle of wine to put a note similar to this uh, that listed uh, the day and the time they reached the, the, uh, they reached the summit. 
and then they put this inside um, the bottle, close the bottle, put it inside a little um, cairn of, of stone, so a pile, uh, made a pile of stones over it, and they went, uh, went back again. Uh, so this is one sort of record. She copied this to the journal, and then there is this slip uh, with uh, with the same notes in in pencil, which is interesting. The records, um, but eventually she well needed to prove it. And when she's going through this turmoil, she has nightmares, dreams about being uh, stuck amidst and climbable mountains and then she eventually writes this in her journal i thought not of certificate nor cared more for mounting the vinimal than mont perdu the ascent of which last mountain nobody believes what mattered it to me i made each ascent for my own pleasure not for eclat what is eclat to me what is eclat to anyone too often a dangerous bubble the lightning's forked flash uh, that kills the object it has fixed on. So how did she go about fixing this? Well, that, it was basically with this document. And the story of how this document came to be was started right after the prince denied, uh, sorry, uh, denied her achievement. And, uh, and Lister sent Charles the guide to persuade him uh, and admit that he was wrong. But the prince basically heard Charles and said, no, 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 no. I have a certificate that proves I did it. So the achievement is mine, irrespective of what you say. And Charles went back and told his twin Lister and then Walker, who were obviously not pleased. And Walker may have been a little bit annoyed um, to the point that they essentially decided to, to seek legal assistance outside that area. And they went to Lourdes, to hire a guide whose name was Mr. Latapi. And Latapi uh, initially heard and Mr.'s version and he thought, okay, you claimed like uh, the Duchesse de Berry, or, so he assumed she had been carried there, but then she explained that no. And then Charles went on and told the story all over again. And Latapi decided that yes, he believes them, he would help them. So he produced this document, which is a certificate for Caso to, to sign. And it basically said that she and the guides got to the summit of, of the Vinimal on that day, at that time. And, uh, well, basically, all she had to do now would be to make him sign the document and it would be fine. She would have proof. So they come back um, and try to, to meet um, Caso, and eventually they get him in Jedre and they go to an inn. Things don't start very well because Charles starts to to talk to him and then they almost come to blows. Uh, but Anne Lister is adamant that she will support Caso uh, in case the prince is using him as a scapegoat, which is a nice thing to, to do. And eventually Caso just admits to his folly and says that the only reason he did what he did, uh, or rather the innkeeper basically tells them uh, this, is that he needed to feed his family. So if he got two, two, two times the money, it would be an obvious benefit. But obviously, Caso, after he, he, this, is, this is known, he just signs the certificate that proves that then was the first to reach the summit of Inimal. And this is what we see here. Those are the only examples I've seen of um, their um, signatures. You can see Caso at the top directly after after the the date then at the bottom you have charles and sanju and then you have a, another um signature which was for uh, for a guy that was at the inn i don't think it was the innkeeper it was just the witness so this 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 should be enough proof um and then after this and basically just pays, and she and Charles have to rush back to saint sauveur because Anne wants to be on time for dinner with Anne Walker, or else she could find a very annoyed Miss Walker. Uh, if you're curious about the Vinimal and the whole debacle, we have a particularly detailed article at Pact with Potential that you can have a look at. So 
unsurprisingly, in 1838, and Lister also went to Spain with Anne Walker. And um, of these excursions, only half, one and a half, is recorded in Anne's journal. And uh, this is basically the, the excursion to Torla, Jaca uh, Penticosa, after, after the Vinimal, and then an overnight trip to Bosos. Um, well, these these are particularly interesting because at first when I when I read uh, these bits, I knew that there should be more because obviously something something uh, had to 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 exist uh, for for the bits that are not uh, present in the main journal, um, and uh, I kept kept looking at this. But uh, the the interesting part of this these two trips uh, is that even though Tordola, Jack and Pentecost only exist in accounts. Bosost is fairly fairly detailed in, in the main journals. So they knew that they shouldn't go to Spain without having a permit for the horses, because if you lost a horse or uh, something happened, you needed to pay a fine for that. So essentially, they, they needed to get a paper at the customs office to say that uh, th those horses are sort of insured. And if something happens, well, you pay. And you don't have any legal repercussions. If you don't pay, you'll be in trouble. But that day, they just go to the va a valley of leaves, and then Lister will basically just say, "Yeah, let's go into Spain." They don't have a permit for the horses, and then Lister also has with her her McLean tartan cloak, which she uh, realizes on arrival at Bosost, it's not there anymore, and the, Mc the McLean tartan cloak is an object of sentimental value that she brought to Montperdu, and she obviously did, did not want to lose. So what they do? Well, she loses her mind and sends Charles back to look for the, for the cloak. Charles goes back, eventually stopped by a customs officer who asked, them, uh, asked him if they had gone to Spain. So Charles panics. And what does he say? No, 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 no. They only went for a petit promenade, so a short walk. It was just a short walk, nothing to see here. It's perfectly fine. The customs office apparently bought that, but when Charles tells this to Anne Lister, she says, if we run into another one, I will say you lied and you'll be in trouble. Um, so eventually... They, they come back to, to France the day after. They don't run into another cost, customs officer. Uh, the cloak is finally found again. She pays the guy who found it, and all is fine again. So later on, when they are going um, to, when they are in the area of the, the Pic de Midi d'Osso, there is a third excursion into Spain uh, to Salon, which is only recorded in Anne's accounts. So I knew in back in 2020 when I had transcribed this trip um, and went to the archives, I knew that there should be more. And I went back uh, in a logic way. So I went to the accounts and that's when I, I figured that, yeah, that there was actually more and could map what was left of the trip. But... As with many other things with Anne Lister, there is yet another part that is not necessarily all told in the journal, and it's told with some papers that uh, one of my colleagues uh, came across in France. And that is the story of Anne's time in Moléon. So if you are interested in, in this part of the Pyrenees, you'll probably uh, have read the, the, the bits of the journal from uh, early October of um, late September and early October of 1838. And she hints at some issue at Moléon. And she's again in looking for La Tapie. But what the journal has is actually the end of the story. And it basically went like this. So they were going to Spain again, this time to Val Carlos. And uh, on the way, they stopped at Moléon. And in Moléon, there is a, mis a misunderstanding with the gendarme because the gendarme or police officer thinks she is a man dressed as a woman, and he thinks she is traveling with um, a fake passport. So, but the problem is, and Lister at first thinks is a beggar, and she offered him money, which is interpreted as Lister trying to pay so he doesn't uh, arrest her. 
And obviously this goes really, really badly. So she and then Walker are held in a state of prevention, which is basically not the, not being arrested, but actually not being able to leave that place until they say so. Their passport is confiscated and the report is produced saying this, people are traveling under false pretenses. Uh, and then Lisa eventually argues um, her point and uh, they are released again. And she decides to go after the Prefet de Pau to make sure that in some capacity something is done because this is an uh, unfair. This is, uh, they are saying, oh, you, you are a man traveling uh, dressed as a woman with a fake passport. So, and eventually, well, detained them. They, they couldn't go away until they they decided uh, it was fine. So then um, and Lister talks to the, the, the sous-prefet uh, in Po. The guy writes a letter to the prefet de Po and informs him that they had arrested um, at Moléon a person who they thought was a man dressed as a woman. So basically recounted what the, the gendarme uh, said. He says this person had offered money uh, to the gendarme so they could walk free. Um, but obviously this is disputed by an Lister and she wants to speak with the Prefet de Po in person. So she, in, in the records, you, she says that they went there. You never get told what exactly went on in that conversation. But whatever... Uh, it was didn't leave her very satisfied because then she decides to track down Mr. Latapi and Latapi writes a letter uh, to help her uh, explain this to a higher authority because she thinks that she went through so much trouble that someone must be held accountable and with good reason. Uh, so Latapi tells her that um, she could have that letter, send it to the Prefet de Pau, and if the guy disregarded her again, she should just escalate the matter to the Secretary, uh, Secretary of Foreign Affairs, and if that failed, she could then apply to the War Department, so she, they would escalate progressively. Um, Lata P then proposes to, to get that written uh, for her to sign the next day, and she was just leaving the period the next day. Um, he got that done. The letter exists. You can see it uh, in Calderdale too. It's all in French in, in a funny, funny handwriting. But the crux of the matter is that uh, Anne really was annoyed at this. And one of the, the lines on the letter reads as follows. If there is no excess of power from the gendarme and the officer, there is at least fault and a very serious one. So at the very least, she just wanted um, a reprimand. What happened after that, honestly, I couldn't find more information about it. And I know that people have looked at this also didn't find anything of note until recently, uh, up to, to today, as far as I know. Um, well, she leaves the Pyrenees. They then go, go um, continue their trip in the south of France. The matter won't be mentioned again. Um, until she, she lives again, for, she lives on that day on the 3rd of October of 1838, when she and then Walker get to Paris in November of 1838 and did write to the embassy to ask if there were letters for her, because in, in this letter from Latapie, they instructed them to, to forward any, any letters they had to the embassy. Uh, that apparently didn't happen. The matter is not referred uh, to again. Uh, then Anne tries to speak with the lawyer for the British Embassy. She never tells why she wants to do that. Uh, and then things basically just blow over and the matter is not, not mentioned again. And yes, we also have an article about this impact with potential, so the story is much better told uh, there than I, I could do here. Now, how much did Anne Lisa explore in the Pyrenees? Well, that's a funny question because I actually made a map as I read and you cannot um, see all the, uh, the, the dots here because the screen is too small and I add only a, a little bit uh, of leeway here, but you can see the majority of them. So the blue ones, uh, are, the squares are from 1830, are Those are the spots she visited in 1830. Then you have the red ones, which, um, Sorry, no, I made a mistake. The squares are 1830 red ones. 
the lozenges 1838 in blue, and then you have the circles, which are common stops between 1830 and 1838. Finally, you have a, a few um, dots, which are mountains from their climbs uh, during this the earth time the Pyrenees. And uh, the main routes in yellow in, with the circles are common to both trips. You'll see that there is quite a lot of stuff that is common. So basically the 1838 trip is like uh, the main stops from 1838 with a lot more sightseeing and more excursionizing than, than she did um, before. Now, moving on to Anne's legacy in the Pyrenees and beyond. And this is actually pretty cool because um, we tend to think that and Lister's story started to be told by John Lister, but actually it was being told years before that by Vincent de Chosinck, because he went back to the Pyrenees after and left, um, and he spoke with um, Jean-Pierre Charles, who told him about Anne Lister's um, climb and, um, well, explained that... that um, what she had done, and well, she was, think, was impressed. He, he wrote down in this book, quote Charles as saying that she had une courage superlative pour une femme, which is to say that she was really, really brave. And the second edition of Shosink's book was published in 1854. And basically, it's the first source that I could find that actually says what happened and um, includes this, this account by Charles. Then there's another one uh, which came later, which is Henri Beraldi's Saint Anne's of Pyrenees, which includes this story too. It quotes largely from um, Chesink, but it also includes a quote from another person who knew and listed at the time, who was the son of Henri Cazot, and it describes an, an as une superbe femme which is the title of this, this presentation. I couldn't pass on the opportunity. And they also told uh, told Shosink about, uh, sorry, Beraldi about an Lister's time in the Pyrenees. So both of them uh, coincidentally interviewed people who knew Anne Lister. And if, you, if you're wondering why Beraldi never spoke with Charles, well, the answer is very simple. Charles died in 1842. So this poor Charles actually died, not like Charles Lawton who lived for a while longer. Um, and then and the story after the publication of this was mentioned in other French uh, sources, mainly newspapers and other Pyrenean history books. Um, but well, she pops up here and there uh, some years before um, before John Lister and this publication of, of her journals. But that's not the only thing. And Lister is one of the few people who has a, a couloir named after her, uh, so a mountain pass, which we see here. Uh, it's called Couloir Lady Lister, and it's at 3,200 meters in the, the Vinimal Massif. Um, it's curiously above the Voie de la Moscowa, named after the Prince de la Moscowa. So ironically, she is still above him after all this time, and she will be for eternity, which is a cool thing. Um, but then there is more to this. Um, and his legacy was a thing that, that started to be preserved by these people, but then the enlisted research people started to, to do more stuff. And one of them, and my favorite, my absolute favorite, is Vivian Ingham. And Vivian Ingham uh, was one of the pioneers of enlisted research, which if you have not heard about it, you should, absolutely should. And the first, um, time that she apparently went uh, to, to look at the journals, it was for, for uh, research on textiles for a job that she had. So she went to Shipden Hall and saw all that, but then she got interested in the um, mountaineering and then and travels. But that came only after the war. Um, and Vivian Ingham went a step further. She actually followed in Lister's footsteps and went to the Pyrenees. So there is information from people she met there of what she was studying. Um, sadly, Ingham died uh, in 1860, uh, sorry, 1969, and she published only two articles about it. One is Enlisted Ascent of Vinimal in the Alpine Journal, and the other one is the one we see here, which is the Antiquarian Society article she wrote um, for the um, 
antiquarian society. Ingham is a, a, a fairly important person in my career as a, as a code breaker and, and researcher, as if we can even call it a career, because Ingham was the one who gave the final push. Back in 2019, I, I became aware of Unlister, as many people do through, through Gentleman, Gentleman Jack, um, read quite a bit about Unlister after that, and then I thought I should should learn more about her. So I went online and kept uh, kept looking. I, I came across um, a mention of her mountaineering, and through that I came across Vivian Ingham's article, and I read that. I thought I must transcribe this uh, and read it in the original because at the time you have no transcripts, you need to do <laughs> to do it yourself. So I hoped that one day I could transcribe that. And eventually it did, uh, six months after or so. And since then, well, uh, quite a lot of things happened in Hebrew today. But Ingham didn't um, inspire me. She also did the same for Luc Mori. And Luc Mori was a French historian who corresponded with Yuvi and Ingham. Initially, they they came to, to contact with each other through a friend, um, a guy named Pierre Verquet Lacoste, who was the hotelier that Yuvi and Ingham met in the Pyrenees. Maury studied in Lister's landmark climbs in the Pyrenees mostly. Uh, he has articles about Perdu and Vinimal, and eventually he published this book that we see here, which is actually um, my copy of his book. Um, it basically is a French translation of the key bits about an climb uh, of Vinimal in 1838. Uh, sadly, Luc Maury is already deceased, so you cannot chat with him. And this would bring us to the end of the actual um, presentation on the day before we got to look at the, the archive uh, material uh, being uh, exhibited on, on site on the day. I would like to thank uh, the West Yorkshire Archive Service, specifically the Calderdale team, for all the assistance in planning this. Um, it was a great experience. Thanks again, guys, for that. Um, also, the Pact with Potential team for threatening me, uh, threatening me into doing things I think I would like to do, but I'm not entirely sure I should do. And also, thank you to the um, Halifax Antiquarian Society for the permission to show the article uh, from Vivian Ingham. Uh, supposing that at the time you eventually uh, find yourself watching this, uh, Twitter is still a thing. This is my handle. If not, well, and you like dog pictures and landscapes, the Instagram one is the same. If it's not a thing anymore, well, you can use uh, the contact for Pact with Potential or have a look at the Enlisted Research Summit website, and it's easy to get in touch. Now, to the bonus, the archival material. First one, the 1829 passport. So this is the passport she had with her um, during that 1830 trip. Uh, the date of, on the document is actually 1829, uh, which could be confusing. But if you look at those really, really nice um, stamps, you'll see that the majority of them are from uh, 1830. Whoop, whoop, spoilers. Hold on. Um, and you can see quite a few interesting ones here. The one I would uh, point to you towards is the, the one on the right which shows the Vielle check. And it's actually the one that proves that she had this passport with her during this trip. And since she didn't uh, change passports, um, this had to go with her to, um, to Perdu. And it was actually the bit that uh, made it obvious to me that I was looking at a document that was more important than it met the eye. Um, so this is one of the reasons I I considered it. Initially, it was not supposed to be on display on the day. Um, it ended up by suggestion uh, from the Colordale archivist, and um, it was a fantastic idea. Well done there, um, because it's actually an item that that shows that you can look at a thing and think it's very simple, but then you realize that there is more to it than meets the eye, and you can tell a much more interesting story than than um, you thought initially. Then we had the um, Travel Journal 6 uh, on display and specifically open on this page, which shows the note left by the captain from Broto that says, and Lister is no, 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 not a spy. Um, and it basically just proves that she was at Torla on that day. 
Uh, once again, it's uh, this page proves also that the, the document went to Montpertu. Um, and well, the only reason you see the handwriting in, in a different style is because the captain wrote this uh, himself. And if you turn the page, you, you would see the actual signature of the guy. Um, going back to, to one thing that was referred to, there are two items surviving from Pertu, this one and the passport, and another two items for, from Vinimal, the map, and also the passport from 1838. So it's a nice combo. You can actually see in total four items that went with then listed to certain uh, ascents in the Pyrenees, which are which is which is an interesting uh, thing to consider because it's been quite a while and these items survived all that. Uh, then we had also journal number 22 opened on this page showing this sketch of Mont Vinimal. Uh, it's interesting, but more of a curiosity because it includes her sketch, which is one of the best ones she has she has made. Uh, the other ones are not, not as good. Um, if you look at that semicircle above and you wonder why, why, is, she, why is it there? Well, the answer is simple. It's basically so, so she could... Um, know where she was standing and what she was looking at and there's a little list of what you can see from that position so if you would stand on the same position and you looked in the same direction using that little semicircle with dots you would end up seeing exactly the same landmarks which is pretty cool in the grand scheme of things um and finally we also had this um side note on this don't do this to to volumes this is not how, how you use it you should use a pillow and the proper weight here, uh, well, uh, not so much as, uh, such care was taken. My apologies to, pro to possible archivists seeing this. This is not how it's done. But essentially, this is the account book from 1838. And you can see uh, here the accounts from uh, Spain. And this actually shows a part of the trip that is not in the main journal. Um, Basically, you can follow her using this. You won't find entries like um, you'd find in the travel journal or in the journal itself. But, well, it helps tell a part of the story, even, even if it's not uh, complete. Sadly, as I mentioned, this trip is not recorded in the main journal. The accounts only provide this limited insight uh, of the activities she did prior to returning to uh, France. So this is marks the end of this presentation. Thank you again for watching. I hope you find it interesting. And if you're curious about archival material and all that, by all means, go explore.